the computer. There we go. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Black Hot Red Spad coming to you from London, United Kingdom. Uh, we've got Chris Sidiel from New York on today. He's a volatility trader and uh, one heck of an expert in options. And uh, we're going to be learning a considerable amount from him uh, re regarding what's happening in the markets, uh, how uh, the VIX has been, the, the VIX correlation has been broken, uh, what he sees happening going forward, and uh, you know how we can take advantage of uh, certain trends that are forming. Jamie is going to take over this one since he did a stellar job last week interviewing me and, and getting me to tell my story. So, Mr. Glancy, over to you, kind sir. Thank you, Adrian. Cheers. So, Chris, how are you doing? Good, good. How's it going, man? Yeah, it's not bad. It's not bad. So, it's just been an interesting week last week. There's all sorts of funky stuff going on. Can you tell us some of your thoughts about, um, obviously, we had the spot vol correlation broke down. We saw guys confused. The VIX was going up. Markets were going up. Um, obviously, we saw how it ended coming into sort of Thursday and Friday with a little bit of a correction. But um, if you wouldn't mind telling us some of your thoughts leading into um, leading into the end of the week. Yeah, sure. So, uh, interestingly enough, the way how we trade at the Amherst Group is predicated around the correlation between spot and vol. So, that's a big thing for us. So, Coming into uh, the week prior to last week, um, or was it? No, it was last week, beginning of last week. Uh, you started to have this correlation break. And with my partner and I, we've seen this for, um, for quite some time now. However, it wasn't this emphatic and it's not this persistent, right? So we actually had this uh, very rudimentary way of looking at it. We call it green, green days. It's, it's funny enough, right? Like that's without putting any quantitative side to it. Like when we would see, uh, vol up and spot up. That's kind of how we would look at it. And when we're trading vol R, it's more of a signal for us to kind of arb that back into line, right? So when you see that take place, it's more of a signal for us to say, okay, well, let's, uh, let's add some short vega to our book here. But when we actually notice this, this time around, with all the instability taking place in the market, all these conditions breaking, all this, this uh, unstable sense, that's uh, this unstable sentiment, that's taking place, we just said to ourselves, well, it's not the right play to actually short this here, right? Because when things are not making sense, you don't want to have much more conviction and size into a trade. So the way we looked at it was you had this break, but we can't fully size into a short Vega. We want to kind of wait until we start seeing the correlations come more into line. Um, and, you know, we have a few guys on the street that we, you know, we talk to other brokers and stuff and, and those guys are really good with actually relaying information to us. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to say any names or anything like that, but uh, we actually got the information before the, the, you know, the, the media got the information to say like, Oh, you know, there's a big buyer in tech and somebody's buying up, uh, you know, a lot of uh, tech calls prior to the CRM earnings. And, um, you know, dealers are short um, and they're going to need to cover some of that up. So we kind of got that, that uh that head nod a little bit before it took place so what the way how we looked at it was okay this isn't a situation that is not driven by supply and demand supply and demand is driving this right so you know it's a large institution that's coming it's not like oh there are it's, it's widespread across the landscape to say that everybody sees it this way right it's just one huge player that's that's coming in and and making this this correlation break persistent so we looked at it and we said all right you know this doesn't really make sense let's just wait on the sidelines let's just see kind of how this plays out and um what made this so special is that you rarely see it when the market is at all-time highs and techs at all-time highs and you get this correlation break and vix was so strong but you know there's a there's there's a few ways that guys could look at this too is that with the market being so high people were looking to buy downside protection, right? With, with all that was taking place, guys were buying downside protection. And it makes for a really interesting dynamic because when you get the sell-off, let's just say the market does pull back, you don't have the velocity to keep that sustained because guys were already pre-hedged in a way. Right? So if, if I'm long the market all the way, all the way up top, and then before 
the implosion, I am buying volatility, right? When the market falls apart, there no longer is that massive need to head to the exit door, right? So everybody's not mm-hmm. heading to the exit door at once, like how they generally would. And with that being said, you don't have the massive vol blow up. So we actually believe like, okay, correlations will come back into line because you had this sort of pre-hedged activity that took place. And, uh, you know, that obviously we, we talked to a few guys in the street and we have our, our data on how we look at those type of things. But for the most part, that's kind of how we viewed it. And, um, you know, towards the end of the week, you actually did see correlations come back into line. You know, the market was, was down and, um, you know, fall was down. So obviously it's not the, the purest correlation, but that it was like that rubber band effect where it's already stretched mm. out, you know, and now it's just like coming back into line. So we did add a little bit of, uh, we did add some short Vega on, on that weakness. Um, we do think that vol may contract a little bit more, but again, you know, it's like, it's, it's uh, trusting your discretion in an environment where the math gives you a guidance, right? So the mathematics gives us a guidance and we understand the environment is a little bit unstable, right? So we're not going to bet the house on shorting ball here, but we could take a little bit of a, we could take a little bit of a starter play and just say, all right, let's, let's take some short ball to, to get the correlation back in line. So Chris, I have a question, you know, as someone who uh, knows a bit about options, uh, I've learned a lot from Jamie. I've read a few books and I've traded the, the instruments myself, but for any viewers who don't really know much about the field, um, why would you choose to, uh, why would you choose to go short Vega or long Vega, you know, just in very layman's terms, um, where would, where would someone choose to do that? Oh, that's a really good question. You see what, what makes uh, options so special is the fact that you have, you know, an, um, an asymmetric payout, All right? Mm-hmm. So if, if I'm long a call, like technically uh, my expected value on that is much more positive than me being short a call. So <clears throat> it really boils down to, and, and this, is, this is my belief, you know, this is what makes us as practitioners. People will believe certain things and they'll go against you and with you on that. But I think the short vol trade can be looked at in a sense of historical. So you could go through historical data and it could give you a sentiment to say, okay, historically when this has taken place, you know, the VRP spread has been crushed, right? You can capture VRP and you, you could you could short volatility. However, if you go through data and try to apply the same thing on the long vol side, it's not really that applicable. And, you know, some people will sit here and argue with me and say, you know, oh, GARP models work or whatnot. And, you know, like I, I'm, I'm not a believer in GARP models. Like there's just something I just don't believe in. Um, one of our partners on, on the team, he was part of the uh, quant team at Citadel for 15 years he doesn't believe in GARP models, you know, like that's a huge quant shop. And, you know, when you talk to other guys out there, they're just like, oh, you know, some of it is BS. So when you're looking for a long vol opportunity, I think it should be expressed in a form of viewing a catalyst, not in a sense of looking for a a statistical backing or historical data to say, well, this is why I'm, I'm, you know, going long ball. On the short fall side, I, I think, you know, for the most part, if you look at the short fall trade, the quote unquote carry trade for, you know, if you go back all the way, you'll see it's a profitable trade, right? And, you know, I give a lot of people nonsense about running this trade systematically because I don't think that's what, that's how it should be executed because, you know, you run the risk of ruin and, I think a lot of guys, we, which we've seen with a lot of funds have kind of went under by trying to replicate that. That's not the smart way to trade it. But if you have certain parameters around it and you have certain signals, historically, the trade could work out fairly well. On the other side, if you're a long volatility, right, you just, if you're just doing it in a systematic way, you're just going to bleed. You've just been long volatility for, you know, you're just buying downside puts for 10 years. Well, guess what? You've just bled out a ton of money. And then, you know, when the market does tank, okay, yeah, you made a, a, a shit ton, but you didn't even get to break even because you've been bleeding for 10 years, All right? So I, I guess what I would say is that from, from a, a sense of wanting to go, wanting to short volatility, it has to be predicated on the statistics. I think that's the quantitative side and adding certain parameters to help execute your trade on that and also being very strict with your risk management. However, on the long volatility side, I think it needs to be 
a little bit of quantitative, but you need to stick to the fact that you're looking for a particular catalyst. I think the catalyst mm. is the driver on the long volatility side. And actually, I suppose something to think about there is that, I mean, you see a lot of guys, and we saw it on, on Twitter recently about always holding tail risk protection, always holding some sort of long vol in the tails, always buying uh, downside, ring, uh, well, downside protection, long vol out in the tails. Obviously, over the long run, you bleed, but obviously, some guys argue differently. Obviously, you see uh, Taleb always on Twitter saying, um, it's like insurance, you'd always have insurance. Um, but are there any sort of cost effective ways that guys can, without spilling any trade secrets, of course, um, that guys can hold on to sort of downside risk in a sort of optimized manner so that you're not constantly bleeding? Is there some simple way? I mean, you see some guys say, um, I'm not, what's the name? There's one book that I've read by a siren, I think it's Unperturbed by Volatility. I think he recommends essentially exposing yourself to kurtosis by shorting um, and net the money puts and buying a ratio of like 10 delta, 10 delta puts. So you effectively net out your, you become vega neutral or cost neutral or whatever, delta neutral, or one of those combinations or all three um, in different scenarios. Um, but I'm interested, what are your thoughts on holding on to downside protection? And obviously we see in the aftermath of, of crises that it's a losing strategy, especially for the next three years. And I mean, looking in the aftermath of the financial crisis, guys essentially bid up the tails. People are wanting this risk, but then are bleeding out because obviously they're bid at such high volumes that the theta that you're that you're paying, you're not getting as much gamma for that theta. So, what, what do you think is a a decent way to hold on to tail risk protection? So it's very interesting that you say that because our book is comprised in a, in a way that 70% of the time, well, we aim for about 70% of the time we look to be long volatility and we have a 70%. Actually, let me rephrase that. 70% of the book, we aim to be carrying some sort of long volatility exposure, whereas 30%, we aim to help the cost to carry by mixing in the short volatility stuff, right? So we believe in the book as, as a balancing act. And... It's, a, it's an R book, right? So some of the cost to carry is offset by our short vol stuff. Now, if you're running a long only book, that's a completely different thing. And you're going to have to deal with the fact that you're going to go through these periods of bleeding for a, a long time. Um, if I had the absolute solution there, <laughs> you know, I would probably be rich, but, <laughs> you know, I'd be a billionaire. <laughs> But um, you know that's uh, that's the beauty in the game, right? It's trying to find that balance, and um, you know, you 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 should look for relative value trades. And all the smart guys that um, I traded with over the time, you know, being an institutional trader, I think that that's how they've expressed their their way of doing it is through what we like to call our form of dispersion trading and our form of relative value, right? So sometimes you look for uh, certain cheapness or richness. Um, by basically selling the index or selling the ETF and then buying the underlying in it if it's, it's cheap or rich. And, you know, you have, to, you have to do your ratios and see, okay, are the wings trading relatively cheap? Are they trading relatively expensive? Does that make sense? How we like to express this, and, you know, I have no problem talking about our structure because there's no secret sauce in our structure, right? Like our secret sauce comes in, in the statistics and our discretion and, and our output as traders. But the actual structure like we could hand to anybody and, and that's one thing you know like guys all the time they refer to to structures as strategies so i'll see like you know i'll see people talk about like oh you know like this is my strategy is like an iron condor or something like that's not a strategy that is a, a trade structure right then people need to understand yeah. to segregate the two things so our structure what we like to express it is generally we like to play a two-week tenor to a month tenor Recently, we've been going out a little bit further, uh, but we, we like to play the short tenor stuff because it, it carries a high level of gamma. You have a lot of high gamma and a lot of high theta at the same time. Right? So the theta helps our short book, or the, the short volatility side. And the high gamma allows you, when you do get those two, three standard deviation moves, right, you could capture that fast convexity very, very fast. And, and that's what we're, we're, we're in it for. So we like to basically sell uh, an at the money straddle fund the wings on the at the money show. So it's sort of like a condor. Uh, 
you could kind of look at it, right? You're not really paying too much to kind of fund the wings on the index or ETF. And then what we look to do is we look to purchase the vols on the underlying around, you know, five, 10 Delta. So we'll load them up, right? So if you're selling and at the money straddle, you're taking a, a chunk of that premium, you know, we're, we're not using, we're not using the full premium. Um, we do give our way a little bit of a, we do give ourselves an opportunity for the, the actual ETF or the index to move a little bit. We take a good amount of that premium and we're buying these downside puts, right? So we're buying all that convexity. So let's just say we're selling one, um, and this is just, a, this is not an exact example, right? But I'm just giving you guys an example of how the structure would be in the most vanilla way. Let's just say we're selling one SPY and, you know, we check the correlations, the correlations make sense. We check the skewness, the cheapness makes sense. We check, you know, how is the, as is the implied vols trading on the underlying to the asset is, is the ratio on that trading cheap. And then all, all our checks and balances come off and we say, okay, well, let's look at Apple and Apple matches all those things, right? So we'll look to, to use a large portion of that spy straddle and fund Apple 10 Delta, five Delta puts, right? So we're taking a good amount, we're selling one straddle and we're getting to buy like five or 10 or something like that. So that's how we kind of look to express our, you know, long volatility. And, you know, it, it's, it's, not an, uh, it's not an exact science. Whereas, you know, some people will be like, well, you know, like you have the upside, you're, you're unprotected on the upside that's kind of balanced out by our short vol stuff. We have our short vol stuff that where, where when the market does blow out to the upside, our short volatility stuff was there to kind of capture that, right? So that's why I was saying at the, at the beginning of this, why is the correlation so important, right? Because when you have that correlation, that's an inverse correlation in the market and, and, and spot and vol, when the market's going up and vol's going down, that side of our book is now coming in and, and helping out that cost to carry. Yeah, I had a very interesting phenomenon. My first uh, experience with that correlation break was uh, back in 2017 when I started trading uh, ESs and S, not so much SPYs, but you know, mostly uh, ES futures. And uh, I noticed uh, the first time I ever saw it was that the VIX kept moving up and uh, the market kept moving up. And I thought to myself, hmm, this is really weird. What, what's going on here now? And it mm -hmm. kept ticking up and up and up. And all of a sudden, boom, it just, it, it's as if someone took a rug and just pulled it out of the market and it just right. literally collapsed like a stone. And I was like, what the bloody hell's going on here? Until it hit me that guys were probably buying put options to hedge because we were at the top of the market. I think we were 2,600 at that particular point. And mm -hmm. it, it just came so suddenly and so quickly. And then news came out that Kim Jong-un was set to launch a missile or something. So that just accelerated the, <laughs> the, mm -hmm. the damn movement. So mm -hmm. I, I suppose in, in certain instances, we can find that over here as well, where, as you said earlier, the market keeps ticking up. No one thinks anything bad's going to happen. And then all of a sudden uh, you get some slightly bad news, perhaps some portfolio rebalancing and all the, the stale bulls and uh, squeezed, uh, squeezed lungs have to get out. So do you find that this, that this um, heavy weighting in tech that we've seen lately, where five stocks make up, what, 25% now of the S&P, <laughs> roughly speaking? Do you find, do you, I, I don't know if this is my, my thinking is correct here, but do you think that could have perhaps uh, had an effect on the correlation break that we see? Oh, uh, yeah, I do. Um, you know, like, that's a that's another interesting dynamic, too, is how the structure products and, and how those ETFs are kind of taking this up. It's interesting because uh, I, I, was, I was speaking with somebody else on a podcast last week. And, you know, these are some of the thoughts that I was running through in the exact same way. You know, like you, the week before, uh, you know, we watched the ETFs. And uh, I forgot exactly which ETF it was, but I remember saying to myself, okay, you know, the ETF is up and the main drivers in the ETF are all down. You know, like how, how are you having this disassociation between mm -hmm. the actual underlying and the ETFs themselves? So it's very difficult to say for a fact that, okay, you know, or, or say like with much conviction, this is certainly attributing to that, but you know, I would also have to see the stats and, you know, I'd have to do some backdrop, but I would imagine that, that, that that's a part of it also. I would imagine that, you, you know, you are having these, uh, these major correlation breaks that are being driven because guys are firing off capital into different areas and some of the things don't even make sense. And then, you know, another thing that 
that's a real focal point is the low interest rate environment. Like that's, that's where some, that's where people have to really focus on because that's what's making this environment so different and so special is that we're in a situation where everybody needs to generate some sort of yield and you can't do it anymore, right? With corporate bonds, you can't do it with the U S govies. It, people are struggling to do it. So I do think that you, you will have these events where things are taking place where it doesn't seem to make sense that are driven by um, market microstructure and supply and demand imbalances, which is what the primary driver was for the, you know, spot up vol up thing. And again, it's not, it's not that it was like, like, let's just say if there's only a hundred people in the market, right? If there's a hundred people in the market trading the stock market, let's just say everybody else in the world got exited out. It only really matters when the land scope of those hundred people takes over the weight of the average, right? So if one guy is in there and he's bullying the market, right? Only one guy out of those hundred people is bullying the market with, with massive size, right? I tend to like to fade something like that. Whereas opposed to, you know, 20 guys in a more evened out scope, they're taking a particular view on things, right? Cause now, you have one fifth of the market now is a particular view on thing, and right, and they may look to allocate more and more and more over time. Whereas one guy is just taking one big shot, right? Those yeah. are the those are the situations that guys who are who are arb traders they look to take advantage of because it's like, all right, well, you know, you're coming in one side, you want to move the market, you want to take one large bet, and you're moving, you're you're squeezing other people out of their positions. Well, that's when I could come in and steal their lunch. You know, like those are the yeah. situations that you look to to steal the lunch and you don't want to take it where it's like, you know, half the market or, you know, one fourth or one fifth of the market is viewing something in a particular sense. Right. So I think with this particular situation, you, you may see these correlation breaks persist, but I don't think it's going to be as heavy as what we've seen. You know, that move that we've seen where fall was blazing and, and market was blazing, right. That was just on a, on a, Force type of play because of the the, the soft bank position and mm. you know, dealers had to basically go hedge off their risk and mm. you know there were other people out there who had no idea what was going on right they were they were panicking so you did have a little bit of panic and, and, and movement in that and again that's the that those are the areas those are the focal points where if you're an arbitrator or you want you know you want to scoop some free lunch if you if you had the opportunity and your book is not uh, locked up or you know your, your the positions are not already going against you that makes sense to take a shot at that. Mm. And I wonder how obvious it was at the time that you had, well, one large player, SoftBank at the time, moving the market versus, like you say, in, in a different scenario where you could have 20, 20 guys taking a more balanced approach but still moving markets. For you then, as a, as a trader, what are some of the ways that you can, I don't know, use contacts, um, maybe look at different volumes, different patterns to say, I think one guy is taking a massive view on this or it's a more um, diluted, more guys are taking cumulatively, cumulatively a large bet, but in smaller sizes individually. Yeah, so we do have uh, certain ways that are a little bit proprietary that we view, but, um, you know, a big, a big advantage is, is, um, is talking with people. You know, people really, people on the institutional side, talk a lot and that's uh that's one of the benefits of being uh, an institutional guy where you develop these connections and you get the chance to talk to people and they talk and they have clients right it's just you give them good information they give you good information right and um i know it's a little bit difficult on the retail side but if you are on the retail side uh, twitter has become an amazing an amazing resource for mm. people people yeah. to, to to come across news and there are so many smart guys, so many institutional guys that are out there. I cannot tell you how many PMs I have spoke with just because of Twitter, as opposed to LinkedIn. I, I, I probably spoke to like five to 10 PMs ever on LinkedIn, right? But like Twitter, mm. it's, it's immensely, it lets They're more guarded on LinkedIn, aren't they? I've noticed that people are a lot more guarded with the information uh, on LinkedIn, but on Twitter, it's like a freaking waterfall, free flow. People are just open. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, you know, we, we, we had, we, we had a little bit of uh, information um, as to, you know, there was a, a, a big buyer buying tech names, you know, before, 
all these articles came out. But I'm not going to lie, like, you know, like a, a day or two after, I seen a few guys on Twitter who, you know, pretty prominent guys, and they were, they were saying and seeing the same thing. So, you know, if you're a retail guy, if you follow some of the right guys, you, you, and then, you know, you trust their word and their discretion, you know, that could kind of give you an, uh, an advantage. You don't need to be an institutional guy to kind of, you know, talk to a sales trader and talk to, you know, another trader at another shop about flow or, or something like that. Um, but outside of that, um, it's very difficult for a resale guy to be at his screen and trying to, to pick this apart. Um, yeah. Because it's, it's, you know, you really have to, I think the only way this can be replicated is if you track a particular name very frequently, right? So there are some guys that will only trade like five, six names. And if they're watching the order book, right, you're watching level two and you're, you're seeing some of the routes these are going through and the orders are kind of, um, are kind of stacked in a particular way and they're very persistent, right? So like, let's just say every, every time this gets to VWAP, you realize that there's a, a, a 2,000, um, 2000 unit lot coming in for, for some reason, right? You see this and you're not used to seeing this, but you trade this particular name every day. You only trade, you know, five names every day, every day, every day. If you're, because you trade that name so frequently and so persistently, that gives you an edge because you realize, hold on, something is wrong here. There is, this is generally not the case. There's not, you know, thousand lot orders that come in on this name at VWAP. You know, I, I watched the stock every day for the last two years, right? I watched the level two. So level two could definitely be used as a guide, but you know, you've really got to take it as a, you got to take it with a grain of salt and you can't be, you can't be uh, inexperienced to that name, right? Because if you've only been watching the name for a few weeks, that's not really going to do you much justice. But if you, it's a name that you trade, right? Like you, you trade, you know the flow, you, you, you know what looks right and wrong. You could kind of watch, um, you know, you could kind of watch those routes and you could kind of get an idea, but it's not as good as an idea as actually getting a call like, you know, hey, you know, by the way, there's some large one, you know, on the tech names, you know, you're talking about Yeah, the, the blue horseshoe trade, text you know. that everyone likes to get. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> oh cool. Um, Chris, I, I'm I'm curious then. So, obviously, you've moved over to the, the buy side recently. Um, how? I mean, you've only been there for a short time now, but how different would you say your attitude is um, compared to your time on the sell side? How are your skills used differently? And are you able to be more proactive, reactive? What are some of the changes that that you found? Yeah, so, uh, well, I, I'm actually a buy side guy by nature. Um, I, I came out of school, well, I, I traded retail during, during my college days or whatnot, and then I also came out of school, went to the buy side, worked for a prop desk, then worked for a hedge fund, then went over to the sell side, and now I'm back on the buy side. And uh, yeah, I don't think I'm going back to the sell side. <laughs> uh, I think my way of viewing markets have always been leaned towards the buy side, that's just the type of trader I am. Obviously, you know, when you're trading sell side and buy side, it's two completely different games. Um, but my skill set really has not changed much. I've always viewed markets um, from that sense, from the speculative side. However, being on the sell side, you, you, you have a different job, right? Like your job is to, to trade flow. Um, mm -hmm. So you can take a little bit of a speculative view on certain things that you're trading, right? You can, you can say, okay, you know, I'm going to be lean a little more heavier gamma in this particular name because, you know, I, I, I know it has earnings or, you know, maybe I want to take some bagel off the table because, you know, there's some sort of binary event taking place. But for the most part, um, the skill sets that I've developed on the buy side is really what helped me on the sell side. And the sell side helped mold me more into a well-rounded trader. So it's not like to say uh, I'm back on the buy side and I'm doing things, um, you know, like, completely different from, from how I viewed the market before. My viewpoints, my sentiment, the way how I, I handle risk and, I, and how I look to take on trades are the same. However, the operations of my job is completely different, right? Like now it's literally come down to, well, we're taking positions because we want to take the positions, whereas on the uh, sell side, we're taking positions because we have to help, in, um, we have to help institutional order flow. Yeah. 
I was thinking about well, something, you know, while you know, while I was listening to you guys chat about buy side and sell side and all that. And uh, what also occurred to me is that uh, if you look at the trading styles between, uh, say, uh, Europeans and uh, Americans, I mean, I'm South African, as you can tell. So I come from a very stock oriented um, economy, so to speak. Buying stocks is a big part of anyone's DNA, so to speak. And I think in America, it's also a big part of your DNA to be invested in the stock market. But Europe is not that big into stocks. I mean, FX is a far, far, far bigger um, trading instrument uh, here in Europe than, than what stocks is. In fact, I've quite quite often run into other traders and I've asked them, so what do you think of this stock? It's like, huh, stocks? Uh, mm. Sorry, mate, I only trade FX. Uh, why do you think that that is the case that that fx is so big over uh, over here for instance and stocks are just so gigantic in america and fx is virtually non-existent on that side that that's an interesting question i just think that it's uh, the culture the, the culture difference mainly because i mean america holds the largest stock exchange right the, yeah, the, U, the u.s stock exchange is just like it's 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 sexy it's appealing in the u.s right so that's why you have uh kids that are in college, you know, their first year, they want to try to dabble in the stock market. And it's really easy to kind of get that set up. Although I will say FX in this space is definitely growing with some of the younger kids. Um, I wouldn't say that they're trading it correctly, but I see that there's been an appetite, um, mainly because you see a lot of those like platforms are being pushed onto, uh, you know, there's, there's that like uh, MLM type sales structure that takes place with the, uh, with the FX platforms, right? So you get a guy mm -hmm. on board and you know, you, you get a little bit of commission and then he gets a guy on board, but that's not- like that accounts, yeah. Yeah, you know, the, that's not really trading. But what I'm saying is that it, it takes, it, it, it piques an interest in some people. Um, I just think, uh, and I, I mean, I can't speak for you guys over there, but mm -hmm. I, I just think that it's, it's more of like a cultural thing where guys have been trading, um, trading currency and it's just been passed along. Like, you know, like, I, I feel like, you know, like with, with us, that wasn't something that I was ever exposed to. Like, even in my junior days, you know, like I, I went through quite a amount of desks. Like, you know, in my younger days, I was on like an MBS desk. I was on the investment grade corporate bond desk. I was on, um, let me see. Uh, I was on a ton of desks, just straight equity desk. You know, so like I've went through these processes, but I've never, ever been experienced to, to trading currency. I just think that maybe it's because of a, a, a cultural difference. I could be wrong. <laughs> mm. And I guess out there in the States now, where, where FT derivatives traders, or should I say, it's become such a phenomenon. Obviously, you can look online and there's, there's different cultures. Obviously, Wall Street bets is one of the larger ones out there for retail guys who like to take punts on, on options and in most cases don't know what they're doing. And in some cases do get themselves in very, very big trouble. And then in other cases make themselves rich overnight. Um, I'm curious then because where, I mean, we've seen this narrative play out over the last few months and specifically, I suppose, in the sort of bankruptcy stocks like um, Hertz is the first one that comes to mind. Um, how much of an influence would you say, <laughs> how much of an influence would you say, um, these Robin Hooders have on, it, it almost feels like adding inefficiency to a market versus how much alpha are they adding to guys who can front run the order flow? Oh, wow. That's a, that's a really good question. So I'm, I'm very outspoken on this because Sometimes you have a lot of uh, guys and you'll see on Twitter, they'll, they'll be like, oh, you know, these damn Robin Hooders, they're moving in the market. But I think people give too much credence to that. Like sometimes it's just guys are just looking to find a reason to attribute it to it where, look, is there a, a possibility that a good amount of Robin Hooders are buying Apple and stuff? Like, sure. Is that going to really move Apple up 30%? Like, no. Like that's, that's not how that works on the smaller name stuff, the speculative stuff. Like, yes, I will say that I, I would definitely give credence to the way how those guys come in and, and, and they trade because it's very uneducated uh, speculation, right? So people have no idea as to what they're really doing. And 
you know, you see it quite frequently. I think, uh, you know, not to air this guy out or, or anything like that, you know, I'm not the type of guy that likes to put people down, but, you know, we, some, somebody posted a picture of uh, this one guy asking um, on one of those forums, like, you know, hey, is there a possibility that, you know, I could stop the after hours trading? Like, how do I go to my yeah. broker? Or, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's like some guys just have no clue as to like how anything operates at all. And they're, you yeah. know, for in the economy right now in the U.S., the, the interesting part is that consumer, consumer savings is still high. So people have money. To, and they have money to 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 speculate, right? And mm. with with sports betting being shut down, people aren't really going to casinos and gaming, right? I mean, now a little more off, now more so frequently because the NBA is back, and you know you're gonna have NFL back. But you know we're talking about in in, in the height of all these things during the whole um, you know April type of April mm. May. So you have that people have nowhere to spend their money because they can't go out to eat and they can't go to places, right? So. People are literally, they're, they're collecting unemployment. Some, I actually know a few people that have been making more during unemployment than they were in their actual jobs, right? So consumers have this chunk of money and mm. they're looking at the only thing and some guys, you know, are speculative. They're like, yeah, like I'm just going to invest in stocks and they have no idea what they're doing. They're just buying anything. So in things like Hertz or, you know, some of those, like those, uh, those names going bankrupt, I could absolutely see Robin Hooders and, and that speculative money making an effect. And then I also see savvy traders um, diving in on that and taking advantage of that. And, you know, yeah. I'll be, I'll be very honest with you. I think that a lot of banks took advantage of that, including one of the desks that I was on and I'm, I'm not going to disclose it, but you know, like, like we definitely had a look at certain type of flow. Um, not saying we always traded off of that, but we had an idea when, you know, a particular name was being tracked and watched by Robin Hood. It's like, yeah, we would, we would look at that and we would have an interest in that. And, you know, if we had an interest in that, I'm sure there were other institutions out there that were like, well, let's, let's bully this a little bit, you know? Mm. And I think you get that effect where you have these, these, the speculative uneducated money just coming in and they're just dumping money into something. And then you also have the, the savvy guys that are like, Oh, these, these dummies are kind of just chasing this, like let's chase it with them and then, you know, move it up or dump it to them. And then you have the stubborn guys who are like, Oh, you know, this doesn't make sense. Like I'm just going to short here. And, you know, and then and it, it creates the effect that, that we've been seeing. So I do think that there are certain areas where these, uh, these new uh, players can impact, but I think the market also gives, well, a lot of people give too much credence to them. Like they're not mm. moving markets as much as people think. And I, and then, you know, you've seen the numbers from like uh, Citadel and a few other shops that took advantage of the, the Robin hood order flow. And, you know, obviously they've been making money on it. And I think there's other shops making money of it. So it is enough to warrant um, people to, to, um, to nod their head at, to say like something's going on. Right. But it doesn't mean that's the reason why, you know, the queues are, completely through the roof right there's there's mm -hmm. more there's more buying towards that there's more sentiment towards that and again especially in, a, in an environment where global race remains super low and people are just hungry for yield searching for yield they're rotating into some of the, the riskier stuff right because mm -hmm. they're just like you know like if i'm if i'm going to be invested in stocks i want to go for the for the growth i want to go for the the, the, the sexy names the the names yeah. that could that could return, you know, 30% in, in a month or two months. And it's still there. It's, um, you know, the appetite is still there. Like, our, like Zoom reported, I, I want to say last week or the week before, week before yeah, that. Yeah, like last week. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. Like 30%, 30% in yeah. one day. Like really, really yeah. fathom that, you know, like that, that's big. That That's huge. Um. Mm. So. Yeah, I am. Yeah. I, I was thinking about something now as well. There was a an interview with a guy called Peter Lynch, uh, who, whom I think he used to work for. Was it TD Ameritrade or Fidelity? It was one of those. I think it was Fidelity that, that he used to work for. And uh, he often got asked the question, um, if I invest $50,000 in a $50 stock, how much money can I lose? Uh, then he would say, well, $50,000. And then the same person would ask him, how much could I lose if I invest $50,000 in a $1 stock? Uh, $50,000. Uh, 
He said, people often confuse price with position sizing and position value. And, mm-hmm. and, and I think even if you look at many of these stocks like Hertz, which got pummeled all the way close to zero, they think, oh, because it's close to zero that, that they, they can't lose as much money as what they would have if it was trading at say 50. Um, but I've seen guys lose their shirts, their hats and everything else by coming in super low because they would just keep going lower and lower and lower. Um, mm. And maybe, maybe that's also driving the, some of the upside action as well, it, we're, as, as in that belief that, oh, it's so low, how much lower can it go? Let's just start buying. Uh, maybe volumes were a lot lower than, than what we'd expect. And did you notice any difference in volume, for instance? Um, that's, that's not something I could really speak on because, uh, there wasn't anything that really stood out to me in particular in that. Um, especially, you know, like when, when you're talking markets, there are so many different segments of the market, right? So if you, if you're talking about the area that, you kind of play in or, or you don't play in, it's important to understand and know who are the players in that area, right? So for example, when I was on the exotics desk, I'm not going to be trading against uh, a grandma that just wants to go long on, you know, like <laughs> Apple, right? Right. Like, so like, you know, so the way how I, the, the way how I cater my views, you know, the way how I cater my views has to be more in line with the players that are at the table, just like poker, right? Exactly the same way like poker, yeah, right? Yeah, Whereas, yeah. Whereas if you are, you know, in Vegas at, you know, 2 a.m. in the morning and everybody's drunk, you know, well, this is probably, uh, you know, the, the, the environment that I'm in is probably meaning that these guys are going to be a little more aggressive. They're going to be a little bit uneducated with their hands, right? Like, it's, it's the same. It's the same way. So when I find it very hard to generalize this from a broad scope across the land, right? Oh. You can't, you know, you know, it, it, you kind of got to break down what specific sector, what specific name, what specific uh, product are we looking at? And then kind of make the assessment. Well, OK, is this going to have more people buying? But in the in the more uneducated realm, like uh, for that, those like type of names, like I definitely would say that there's that psychological effect where guys are like, oh, you know, this can't go lower than this. How, how much lower can it go? You know, it can't go much lower. And yeah, like all the time, and, you know. And again, you know, like in the U.S., there's a lot of wealth that is going around right now. I think people, they don't give too much credence to that. There are a lot of people who have made a lot of money and now their kids are in school and they could afford to give a lot of their wealth and fortune over to their kids. Right. So Americans are living good. Contrary to what, whatever may be on the news, people who work at Walmart could literally afford to go to Mexico and afford a trip and like they could spend money. People are, people are very high. Right. So, you know, so there is money out there for these uneducated individuals to try to make speculative bets. And I've absolutely heard that many times that like, where where they'd be like, Oh, you know, this can't go any lower. This can't go out of business. But you you know, when you're at like a party or something like that, um, but you know, to be honest, those, those conversations are a little bit frustrating. So my partner and I, we, we laugh about it because we're just like, when we hear those people now, we literally don't even, we, we, we just ride with it. Before we used to sit there and be like, like, no, this is why this can't happen. And like, you know, like you're dumb, but we realize it's just as, it's just as silly as trying to like. <laughs> so you, yeah, so you're like the penguins in Madagascar, just smile and wave, boys. Smile <laughs> yes, and wave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yep. Go ahead, Jamie. Uh, Chris, I'm wondering um, where option volumes now have kind of soared a fair bit, I suppose, in the last year. I think I can't remember who put the chart up in was Goldman or JP. But um, how how would you say the well by construction with with Black Shoals and, and guys dealers, where guys where the dealers are short lots of of gamma, lots of vanna. How would you say and I suppose Vanna probably in the last week where that's kind of had a possibly a larger role because obviously vols up and spots up. So the guys are going to buy into, into the vol. Um, how big an impact do you think that now has on markets compared to say 10 years ago? Because obviously we've seen um, the pinning process across, um, I know crude we see it in, single name stocks we see it in, but how would you say that's now affected kind of 
equity indices like 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 SPUs and, and the NASDAQ? It's going to be tremendously big. And, um, you know, we at, at Ambrose, we really anticipate much more of those type of unwinding moves that you see those gamma advantage driven type of moves. Um, you know, the moves that we've seen, like, like in early uh, June, where the market kind of just had that week out of nowhere, where, you know, you're down, you turn mm-hmm. around, you're, 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 you're down 7% out of nowhere. With the increase of the derivative exposure, you now have much more potential for these proclaimed emphatic moves, and they will continue to take place. They're not, you see, this is the environment we're now moving into. You know, people talk about a regime shift. This is the environment that we're moving into. We're moving into the condition where you will start to see more rapid moves to the upside and more aggressive moves to the downside, and it will happen it will just happen in a flash. So I, I don't anticipate that going anywhere anytime soon. I think that traders should understand that this is really the new mark. This is the new market that we're in and it's changing because of market microstructure. We're seeing all these things take place right before our eyes, right? Because there's no doubt, you know, some people, some people like to, to go against some of the, uh, um, market theory behind negative gamma, right? Because they're saying like, oh, you know, you somebody short that gamma, somebody has to buy that gamma, right? So there's a trade-off, but that's not necessarily true, right? Because the players in the market work and operate on different levels, right? So if this particular person who is a speculative hedge fund, they are buying gamma, right? They're not looking to hedge that off. They're just, I'm buying gamma, right? Whereas the mm. dealer, right? Like wh- when I was at the bank, we had certain overnight levels, right? We have to adhere to those overnight levels. We have certain Delta mm. levels, we have Vega levels, right? So we're forced to literally keep those levels in line. So when you have a particular move, like, you know, where, where it falls up and, you know, the Vanna exposure kind of blows up, you, you have to hedge that off. Like you can't just mm. let it sit there. So it's, it's definitely making um, an impact and it will consistently make an impact on, um, you know, on like, some people they they uh they reflect on the uh the corona impact and they don't even realize that was you know the corona was the catalyst that obviously dropped the market but the proclaimed selling and, and shifting of those asset prices came from all those dealers getting caught with their pants down. That was mm. what it was that really made that move so emphatic. And uh, we we specifically I can only speak on you know my team. We believe that that's going to persist going forward is you will continue to see those moves. Um, and it's not going to be like, you know, uh, it'll take place, you know, up or down 7% in like, you know, two months, but you'll see those moves in a week. It will happen in a, in a flash. Mm. And I suppose that then leads into if you're expecting or already thinking we're in this new market regime or, or vol regime, how do you anticipate um, the VRP, the volatility risk premium, looking into the next sort of months into 2021, 2022, when, I mean, I suppose it's a bit of a funky time at the moment. How do you, how do you expect that to look compared to, I suppose, prior years? It's going to be pretty fat. Um, it's going to be pretty fat. I think uh, you will start to see people price that in. Um, but it's interesting because, you know, I, I, I say this and I'm like, a, I expect VRP to be pretty fat, but I'm curious to know how active guys will be in literally just suppressing that. Um, mm. and, and, and that's really the key is to see how active will some of the larger players, like some of the pension funds and some of the vault targeting funds, how, how fast and how active will they be in selling, saying like, okay, let's upsize a little more. Let's let's yeah. sell a little let, let let's sell a little more. You know, we we're, our, this vol targeting fund is up X amount on the year, and you know we have our target here where you know maybe we could maybe this is the environment where we could kind of get back on track or or whatever the case is. So it's gonna come down to to seeing how the market captures that um, because you know the 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 number one rule for sell offs is that when markets don't sell off when it's anticipated. Like I, 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 I've done a lot of studies and, you know, not only in U S markets, but, you know, like just markets in general, they just don't sell off when it's anticipated. 
right? Because that's not, that's not the effect that takes place. It's, it's when everything is chugging along and everything is beautiful and it doesn't look like there's, there's anything in sight. That's where you get the rug pull. That's where you get the, the move. And you know, like you see the market make moves and adapt to those, those, those same sort of catalysts as we go along the way. How often, and you know, you guys are traders, you guys know this. How often do you see a particular catalyst take place and you read the headline and you're like, this shit doesn't even matter too much, but nope, market doesn't like it. Thing is absolutely selling off. You're like, this doesn't even make sense. Right. And then yeah. let's just see, keep getting headlines, keep getting headlines. And then, you know, a month or two goes by and you get those same headlines, the worsening of those headlines and the market's not even budging it on it anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's mm -hmm. fully digested it. Right? So, sort of like the Corona numbers, right. We we're seeing increasing Corona numbers around, right. And there's a, there's a chance for a resurgence, right. Do you, do you tell the market that in, in, um, in April, mm. oh, like it, it's, it's going down. Right. But say it now, everybody's just like, Oh, it's kind of priced in already. Yada, yada, right. Like with the Kim Jong-un news, right. Like I remember specifically when they said like, there, there was like a headline about him launching a missile like tomorrow or something. Yeah. And I'm looking, That's I'm the lo one. yeah, I'm looking at, I'm like, what the hell? Why is the market not down? Like it's literally just, just eating this and nobody cares because and then some just, came out and said locked and loaded and then everyone crapped themselves and like oh shit this just got real <laughs> it, yeah it's uh, so so all those things all those things play uh play a factor as to as to how it moves but um you no know, it's it, my belief is just markets just won't sell off when when the move is is anticipated so it will be uh, very you know it, it will be really interesting to see how I think the spread widens, but I want to see really how active some of the large players are in, in looking to capture that and how complacent the market gets along to that. Mm. You know? It's funny because you mentioned all... that, Chris. It's really, really funny you mentioned that. Uh, and I know that this is not a scientific approach, but I'm sure that you would appreciate some elements of it. What I often do is I go on Twitter or on LinkedIn and I look for people who are very outspoken, but who are experts in the market and all that. And I watch for high conviction calls that they make it, it, it relative to the direction that the market's moving in. If certain people become very convicted that the market has fallen and it will keep falling, I think ah, it's about time to start changing my positions or to start looking for longs. Or if they do the same when the market keeps moving up, I just think ah, if they are thinking that way, then the masses are also very pot committed. You were talking about poker earlier. I look for pot committed situations. So when the market, I think when the market becomes very pot committed, that is when you start seeing these sell offs because everyone, as you say, is just chugging along and la 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 la, you know, yellow brick road. And then all of a sudden, oh shit, you know, this is not <laughs> right. 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 And then, and, and, you know, the, the, the other thing too, why I think it's very difficult to kind of get that sell off and that velocity of the sell off yeah. now without any particular catalyst. Like, don't get me wrong. With the negative gamma exposure, like it's enough to definitely drop the market, but to keep persistent selling, you need some sort of catalyst behind it. Right? Oh, it's yeah. not that's it, that's not enough to really keep the market down. Mm -hmm. You need some sort of like a underlying catalyst behind it. It can't just be you know dealer negative gamma exposure because then people there's price discovery that takes place, right? People are going to come in and they're going to say like, oh, I'm buying this asset. Like Apple price ten percent down. Like I'm buying that. Yeah. <laughs> You, you need more of a, of a, of a driver behind it to actually make that move. And um, the reason why I don't think that the market will really sell off right now, where we're in right, right now specifically is because there, there, there isn't that form of catalyst. And then you have people that are very cautious. There are people that are very quick to, to, to hedge up their risk. Right. So, a lot of large banks, and I'm saying this from experience of, you know, me spending some time at a bank and having guys that, you know, trade on the institutional side, guys are very risk focused right now. They're, they don't want to lose their entire year that they recoup from the Corona thing just by taking on a lot of risk right now. All right. So, so before the Corona thing, right, if you see the market down 5%, guys are going to be like, Oh yeah, I'm buying the dip. You know, like oh, 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 here's an opportunity to buy. You know, but now if you do start to see pullbacks like that, you'll 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 notice guys are a little more cautious. Like whoa, hedge off this area of the book, hedge off this pocket of the book. But, you know, like hold on, like you know, we don't want to have another huge drawdown. So going into the end of the year, 
you should kind of look and, and, and be focused on the fact that guys are very focused on where their risk is and they don't want to lose that much because it's fresh in people's minds, right? That's like trader psychology 101 too. It's like you have this, this, this nasty move that just takes place, right? And then now the market's chugging back for a few months. Everybody who experienced that move remembers that move. So they don't want to say, they don't want to put themselves in a situation now to get involved in that move because they've already been burned once, right? So now when you anticipate the move is coming, you're, oh, I'm hedging the shit off. Like I'm, I'm not even playing with it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not touching it. I'm hedging it off and going about my day, right? So that's why you'll have like the market will capture itself and then, you know, kind of come back because people aren't stubborn into just saying, I'm just going to buy it, buy it, buy it, buy it. And then it's a huge avalanche effect. Yeah, and and I've actually seen instant. I mean, I've done this myself. I think we all have, maybe to some extent, maybe or maybe I'm just the dumbest one in the room here. Very possible, but uh, I, I've averaged into losing positions before, thinking that oh, you know, how much how much could possibly keep falling, and I ended up losing my lunch more mm -hmm. than, more times than on what I care to mention. But but I don't mind talking about my losses in any case. You know, I think uh, as a trader, we need to be able to talk about our losses as opposed to purely about our wins. And, uh, and, and th this has happened to me a number of times where I, I think the bias you refer to is recency bias uh, or something like that, where either for the good or the, or the bad, if something worked uh, five minutes ago, then it should work five minutes from now. Or if it didn't, then it, it shouldn't work five, something like that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's terrible to see what what happened during uh, this whole fall with Corona because I also nearly got caught in a trap where I, I was looking at open interest on the on, on the ES options and I thought, oh, okay, you know, that's like a massive floor that has formed over here. And when the news headlines kept getting worse and worse, the catalyst, as you said, just fell through those floors as if it was not even there. You know, that liquidity blanket did nothing to stop it. And then gradually, as we got lower, lower, lower down, um, I think we saw a decline in the numbers or it started to flatten out a bit. Then lots of buying started coming in, but we also mm. just saw these massive up and down spikes, like 5% up, um, uh, you know, circuit breakers just started kicking in overnight, like three times overnight. <laughs> so, yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Chris, I, I, one question that I really want to ask is, um, how much of a, of a step up sort of mathematically or conceptually is it to sort of manage a small book of options, let's call it just vanilla for now, vanilla options, versus a large book where maybe you're going into, I don't know, hundreds of millions worth of dollars in your control. Um, what are some of the different things that you would be looking at? Are you focusing in greater detail on like the higher, well, like third order Greeks or something? Um, and how do you approach looking at kind of shock analysis? So I don't know, things like, um, in your book, maybe you've got a bunch of term risk. Um, do you model the misshaping of skew changes, I suppose, typically, um, changes to spot bowl correlations, um, maybe inter asset correlations. What are some of the things that really play a larger role in where you're managing? A really large derivatives book versus some of the things that are smaller. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. You know, to be honest with you, the math, um, the math really drives the trades. Um, I guess some people could break it down and also say that the math is in the the management too. But we don't kind of view it that way. We kind of view our Greeks. Obviously, you know, we follow our um, you know our second and third order Greeks. Volga's a big, Volga's a big one for me. Zoma's a big one for me. Um, obviously, you know, Van is a big one for me, but you don't want to overcomplicate things, you know, like sometimes as, as, as quants, you know, and I, I don't even consider myself a quant, like, yeah, well, I'm quantitatively driven, but you have to have that angle where you're letting that discretionary side of you take place, right? So in our model, a, a large part of that is a confidence interval, you know, like we don't believe in just running a, a full systematic quant driven book and the the math does matter like i i don't want to take away from the fact like oh you know you could just go in there and just do everything on field but it's it's the driver to the trade and then when you're seeing things take place from um from the top down right so 
you're looking at the book and you're seeing, you mentioned your shocks, right? So our shocks and our slide levels are, are very important to us. So we want to be able to see what would take place or, you know, you can't perfectly estimate what the Greeks are going to do. People will try their best, right? There's no way you could perfectly estimate. Um, so you could kind of just get a, a broad estimation of how would the book look if, you know, this took place. You know, when I was in the bank, the technology was much, much better. Whereas, you know, us having a, 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 you know, a startup fund, you know, we have to go through different processes and procedures and system. But at the bank, it was literally as simple as this. And we had a bucket and we have certain positions in our bucket and we would see the Vega in that bucket. We would see the Delta, the Gamma. All right. So we would see for this tenor, let's just say one month out on this particular name, this is your risk exposure. So like, this is how much Vega you have. This is how much Delta, the Gamma. And it was a matrix. It was one big matrix. And now we have another matrix that shows me like it's uh, SPX normalized on the, uh, the listed option stuff. And it would basically say like, okay, if SPX dropped 1%, and let's just say vols went up, you know, four vol points, this is what would take place to your book. You know, so having an idea and, you know, like obviously there's a lot of math and, and moving parts into, into a matrix like that, but having an idea to use your discretion to say, hmm, okay, does this make sense to us? Do, do we want to draw down? 5% if the market moves down 1%, like, no, like we have to hedge that off immediately. Right. So then we go in, we'll see what, what pocket of the book that's in. And then, you know, we'll hedge that off and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that if the market goes down 1%, we aren't drawing down 5%, vice versa. If the market goes up 1%, we aren't drawing down 6%. Right. So that's how you kind of balance the book out. Um, some guys could go really super crazy with some of the math stuff. And again, you know, like, there's a million ways to skin a cat. You know, this is this is our way. This is our belief. We do run a a, a ton of math formulas and and, and a, a bunch of mean reverting formulas, right? Like, two of my favorite ones are the ADF test and the Hearst test to kind of see if something holds a mean reverting component. Mm. I'm I'm very outspoken on that. Like, I'm not giving away like any secret sauce on on that. Like, that's that's what I like to do. Um, and you know, we we have other ways of, of formulating our models, but really. There, there is a difference of complexity that comes with managing a small book and, and then a, a large book, but you should manage your book to the exact same standards as somebody managing their portfolio as a larger book, right? So it, that doesn't change. If you give me, you give me a, a $50,000 account or a $25,000 $25, account, I'm going to manage it the exact same way how I would be managing you know, a $1.5 million book. You know, I would structure, obviously, you know, we're not going to make a lot of money, right? Because you're, you, you want to be conservative. You want to be careful and you, you want to aim for a, a realistic return, right? You're not shooting to return, you know, 5,000%. That's just like an unrealistic approach, but you apply that same sort of portfolio management and that same view to the smaller account, right? And that, that comes with constructing a portfolio and that comes with understanding some of the most basic things and you know like you don't need to be super complex in the math to realize like okay well if i if i'm short 25 percent of my entire book in tech names that's a bad risk to reward play right like it's just not how the allocation should go maybe i should spread out the allocation maybe i should move some of that tech stuff into you know some of the utilities or maybe i should move that into another area or, you know, if there's no other trades, I do nothing. I literally just take off the positions, you know, lower my risk and on that on that front and sit on my hands until another trade kind of takes takes uh, takes its place. But um, you know, like that's a that's one thing I think in this uh, in this time that we're in, everybody wants to try to quantify everything. We were in an environment where sorry, we're in an, in a time where coding has become so prominent everybody can code like literally mm -hmm. and high schoolers can code right you can you can quantify every little piece of data that you have but you can't fully quantify the market and that's where the discretionary side kind of takes place and this is why, why i always tell people you just shouldn't sit there and try to overly focus on the mathematics like the mathematics are used for us at least as a guide it gives us a guide, right? We don't want to sit there and look at screens and just be like, 
oh yeah, maybe we should buy this or maybe we should buy it. We want to go through certain ratios and we want certain forms of mm -hmm. analysis and we want to comprise it into a model and we want the model to make sense as to what we're trying to accomplish, right? That's, that's where the mathematics come in place. Like we want to check the correlations and you know, we want to see if something's co-integrated and is it a mean reverting time series and yada, yada, yada. That's when the math takes place. But if you are actually just solely focused on the math, you'll run into the same problem every other quant runs into. And it's just taking the same trade a million times until the one time it doesn't work. And then, you know, you run into the risk of ruin. And that's, that's literally the, the case with every quant, right? Because mm. markets are always changing. You are not going to get a chance to just completely price out the risk. Like they are always changing. It's one large changing dynamic thing that will always be changing because human psychology will always be changing you know so mm. the traits of human psychology may remain the same right if you look at certain charts from um you know this era as opposed to like some of the the charts in the 80s like the human psych psychological traits remain the same but to an extent they're changing you you see certain sectors are hotter there's more risk in certain sectors right the, the economy is changing so mm. it's really hard to say like you know, do you sit there and do you like come up with a bunch of you know equations and, and use the math like completely? Like, no, we don't fully do that, but there is a big component of it that is math driven. And mm. the other side of it is our discretionary side. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of like then, a structure in a way. Sorry, Jamie. Mm -hmm. I, was, I, was, I was then gonna ask, um, obviously because human psychology plays such a massive a massive role in markets and I, I my thought as well is no matter how much you throw algos into the mix how much you throw like quant systematic strategies into the mix even just i don't know regular old systematic strategies how um in in the institutional space how how is technical analysis viewed because obviously it's a very divisive subject some people completely throw it in the bin other people swear by it um, and then a whole load of shades of grey in the middle. Obviously, it's quite a big thing in the retail space, and obviously you'll see guys on Twitter um, posting their technicals a lot. Some guys will trade purely off them. But I wonder then, for guys who are institutional, and let's call it buy side, or even sell side, I suppose, how much credit do you give those sort of technicals? So, because of my experience trading, and because like I've Know, traded from these different angles i view it differently as to how a lot of people um on the sell side view it. so i can't really speak for them i will tell you does hold a negative it does have a negative representation towards it on the sell side some people and even on the buy side too some people just really refer to it as fairy dust but there's a big but to it people don't realize that technicals is a form of quantitative analysis like mm. it is, it, it's, it's a form of the, it's the visual of the statistics, right? So you could literally yeah. g give me a chart and that is showing me some sort of quantitative analysis. It's giving me a, a quantitative approach to it. Now, I think in, in, in our trading, we don't fully implement technicals, but we do have certain components to it that we care about, right? So. I'll give you guys an example. Just on very basic volume analysis, if we realized that there, the, the highest buy volume, and let's just say a stock is at 360, right? And the highest buy volume in the last six months came in when it was at 350, right? We know there are people who bought at 350, right? Like we know for a fact, yeah. right? So. For us to just say, nah, that doesn't mean anything. That's, that's just being dismissive and that's not being intelligent because there are players who played that at that level. So regardless of anything, when that goes under there, under that 350, there were people who bought there and they're now seeing their P&L and they're now negative on the position. That could accelerate the selling, right? So mm. there are forms of technical analysis where – you're looking at, at, at the volume, the, the volume bars, you know, you're looking at the, the VWAP and you're looking at how this trades off of it. Even a simple moving average that has a math component to it that could be viewed in a quantitative sense, right? So those things matter and we do give credence to that. We do. 
we don't give as much credence as technical traders out there who are going to draw like 50,000 lines on the chart. And I've, tra I've really, I've traded with guys like that. They'll draw like a million lines on the chart. And I'm like, dude, this, what does this even say? I, I have no idea what this even means. Like nah. you have to, you have to know when to, um, when to look and aim for the most potent things. And that comes down to, it, it's a subjective feel. You can't like, you can't just pick anybody's game. You have to pick a few indicators that I think you believe in and you have to have a reason as to why you believe in it, right? You have mm -hmm. to go through data and say, okay, this works. I give it, I have conviction in this because this works and it makes sense. You know, like th this, this tends to make sense. Um, and from there, you know, you combine them with other forms of technicals and not overcomplicate it. And I think in doing so, you focus on certain spaces and certain sectors and you kind of finite them and you kind of learn how do these things move and how they play. And then when you combine this side of being, um, being thought driven, right? Well, you, you're, you're process driven and you have a, a thought behind it. Well, you know what? I've noticed, you know, when Apple misses on earnings, it tends to really sell off. I'm going through the data and I'm seeing the one week data, it tends to drop off, you know, uh, about 10%, you know, on average. This, uh, this is not absolute math, right? We're just giving yeah. an example, here, right? And then I say, okay, well, damn, there are a lot of buyers, you know, at this particular level. There's a chance that if it drops down, you know, 5%, it could literally go through there and then there's a ton more people, you know, so a 10% on average move could literally turn to a 15% move. That's where those two things make sense, where you kind of put them. So I believe, I believe in technicals. Do I trade? Do, do we predicate our book off of technicals? No. Is it used as some sort of a guide to, 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 to help us express our confidence interval and our model? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, some guys, some guys take it with a grain of salt. Some guys just dismiss it, and some guys live and die by it. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, to, to me, I just think that it's how you approach it. Is, is, is the biggest thing. Yeah. Well, I could offer my perspective on, on uh, technical analysis or any tool for that matter is I look at, I look at everything in the market like a toolbox. So you have a hammer, you have some pliers, screwdrivers and all those kind of things. And um, it's like when you're trying to build a table, for instance, you know, you have your planks of wood and screws and all those things. Uh, the market is the, the, it is made up of, of the planks of wood that you're trying to make sense of, but you're trying to use all the correct tools to uh, assemble this, this, this thing. And I've, I've run into the same problem that you have as well, you know, where, where, for instance, uh, I've, I've spoken to CFAs, for instance, who say, oh, well, technical analysis is just looking at a bunch of pictures. You know, it's, it, there's literally nothing to it. And I've presented exactly the same argument that you have, that it's just a visual representation of numbers, guys. I mean, let's get real here for a second. But also that anything that we use is meant to be a tool in the toolbox. And, you, you know, you're not going to use a hammer to build a house. You're going to use a multitude of tools to build a house. Um, would you say that that is a... a good way to kind of describe it or would you have some disagreements on on that notion no absolutely and you know it's, it's funny enough that you use that exact example because when i was like a, a junior coming up um at this hedge fund that i was at that was what my md kind of told us you know I, I learned about trading technicals on my own during the retail days right but he explained to us like the, the exact toolbox uh toolbox analogy he was like the market is going to present you with opportunities to take certain things, right? And it's not every time you're going to have to use this exact hammer. So you're going to need to know when do I pull out the screwdriver? When do I pull out the wrench? When do I pull out the hammer? And that's what makes a good trader, right? That's, that's the same way that that's what makes a good construction worker. You know, like they're going to know when to use what tools and how to use them. Yeah. Um, and, and having that ability in your back pocket is something that gives you an edge as a trader. Like, Again, I, you know, like we don't predicate our book off of technicals, but I, but the first thing that I look at, it's funny enough, the first thing that I look at when I'm doing some sort of analysis and I don't know the, the, the stock, where is the stock? Pull up a six month chart. What has it done for the last six months? That's literally, I'm going through some sort of a candlestick analysis to know, okay, well, what has the stock done for the last six months? Then I'll pull up, you know, five year and I'll pull up a max and I'll see, okay, 
you know, so I, I completely agree with what you're saying. It's a visual representation of numbers and it should be used. I, I, I would find it very hard to believe somebody's a, a portfolio manager and they don't give any credence at all to technicals. Like they don't even look at charts in a sense because I, I'm just like, I, I don't know, maybe they know how to do it, but I just couldn't see that. I, I need a visual, a visual representation and I, I need to have an understanding as to how this thing is trading. Like, like I, I use candlestick analysis for doing so. Yeah, I mean, exp ex expressing that, that sort of view. And, um, you know, like even in one of the premises that we've had on, from the team, you know, we, we're a big believer that Jamie and I was just talking about how the, the moves will be more proclaimed because of this negative gamma exposure, right? Mm -hmm. So we're a believer in the fact that you will have much more rapid moves to the upside and to the downside. So what you'll see is you'll start to see larger candles, right? You'll start to see larger monthly candles. Before we even dove into the analysis of, and us checking the variance in, in, in some of the monthly candles and the SPX and some of the underlines, we dove in and we see the math make sense. We didn't even need to do that. Like it took us, you know, it, it took us a while to go in and, and check the names that we wanted to check and make sure that to, to hold some sort of conviction to say, okay, the variance has been increasing post 2017 because of, you know, these reasons and whatnot. But I could have literally just pulled up a, a, a candlestick chart and that could have told me that, right? Like now, obviously you want to make sure that you go in and you do the math and you, you do a, a thorough understanding, but Right, like the technicals can be some sort of a guide and some sort of a lead to, to, to the, um, to the trade, and also, you know, oftentimes it leads you to to expressing your views. Like if a stock is, is trading relatively low, that can be expressed in a six month or a, or, you know five year chart. You know, you don't mm -hmm. need to go to go through the ratios or whatnot. You can literally just look at a chart and say, okay, well, relatively speaking, this, you know, for the last six years, this is traded in the sixties. It's trading in at 15 now, you know, what, what's the reason for that? Now we go in and now we dig in and now we check the balls and now we check the math and now we check the background to say, okay, the stock is, you know, this, this took place, you know, they lost their drug approval or something like that, you know, but I think when people are, are dismissive to, to certain ideologies and ways, it, it shows a level of ignorance and it, it shows a, a, them lacking the biggest thing that's needed as a trader and that's a sense of adaptation when you ad that a, a trader that adapts is always going to be a good trader you know like that's what makes a good trader i um i to tell a very interesting story um about this one guy i used to know who killed it in the 80s he's a, he's a trader at a really large prop firm killed it in the 80s killed it in the 90s i think he did okay in the early 2000s and you know, I was talking to one of the PMs on the desk and this guy has not made money for the last 10 years, right? And like last 10 years, not made any money. Like the, the, the PM was basically telling me like, you know, they don't want to get rid of this guy because, you know, he's, he's had so, so much equity in the firm and he's been around for so long. And, you know, like it's more so like a, a heart to heart thing. Like we can't just chop him, right? We lowered his, yeah. his, his risk levels or whatnot, but, you know, he hasn't made money for the last 10 years. He's been losing us money and, you know, we, we cut some of his risk levels. So this guy lacks the ability to adapt, right? So his job as a trader is, is like, he's completely done now, right? Like he's, he just comes in and he loses money or whatnot, but it's because he just doesn't want to adapt to the condition that's there because it's not, it's not hard to adapt to, to, to what's out there. It's, if you're a stubborn person or not, or if you're forcefully like, oh, mm. this will always work because no strategy always works in every regime. Like any real scalable strategy, anybody who, who really runs the fund will tell you that any real scalable strategy is not going to work in every market condition or regime. You, know, there's, you have to figure out the regimes where this is going to work and the regimes where this is not going to work, right? Like, yeah. No, I was saying to Jamie, I'm sorry to interrupt you. That was, that was uh, unintentional. Um, I was saying to Jamie last week when we chatted, uh, a martial art that I do, for instance, is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And uh, one, 
I'm sorry yeah. to cut you off. I, I, I do BJJ too, yeah. Oh, you I do mean, BJJ as well. So so you would yes. appreciate this. Look here, Jamie. You know, I just we discovered yeah, something else. That's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, so so I don't know what belt what belts are you, if I may ask, just out of sheer curiosity. So so I practice no gi, but I've been training for about four years now. So Okay, so you would be a good blue, maybe even purple belt by now, yeah. roughly. Yeah. So yeah, we're, we're at a similar level. I would also say I'm a high blue, you know, I, I've never actually freaking graded. I never bothered. Um, mm -hmm. quite honestly, but uh, I should also be at the same level as you then. So you would appreciate the whole analogy that if you constantly going for an arm bar against someone, then hello, you know, after the first or second try, the guy's going to be like, what the hell are you doing, mate? I mean, like, I already know what you're trying to do here. And the right. market is, the market is almost like rolling with a black belt. Um, uh, uh, you, you would know what it's like rolling with a black belt. It's like, I tried to describe it to Jamie, but it's like rolling with a cloud in a way except you're drowning, constantly freaking drowning against them because no matter what you try, they come up with a, they, they know what your attack is going to be and they have a counter for your attack and the next one and so on. But in that process, you and I would have to adapt against someone like that. You know, you cannot just simply go and try the same submission. So mm -hmm. if you do that in jujitsu, why would you not do it in markets? <laughs> it just baffles me that, that someone wouldn't do it. Right. I think, I think, uh, again, you know, it just comes down to life and it's a person's way and their view on things. If they're, you know, a stubborn person or, or if they're accepting, you know, the most, the, the smartest people I know are the individuals that know when to accept when they're wrong and they make a change uh, towards it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's the people who are very stuck in their ways that they hold this level of ignorance and, you know, they hold this level of, of uh, self-belief and self-worth towards their thoughts and, that limits them in many ways, you know, because like if, if I'm terrible at something or if I'm losing at something, the first thing I'm going to do by nature is I'm going to look into how do I not, how do I stop this from happening? If I come in every day and I'm losing money, how do I stop this from happening? What is going wrong? Right. And some people, mm -hmm. they just like to, I'm right. This boils down to trader psychology. So it's very useful to, to some of the younger listeners that are listening on this show it really boils down to you taking a step back and assessing and saying, okay, I'm wrong. Whereas some people are now pinpointing their, um, their, I guess, unbelief or you know, their blame onto the market, right? We have this, people have these tendencies to just blame the market. Like, oh man, you know, like I, I, I was short this, but this should be going down. This should be going down, right? But that's what makes a market, right? It's, it doesn't matter as, as to what it should do. It's what it is doing. So mm -hmm. if, if, if this thing is going up 50%, like, sorry, man, there's a market for it that's buying it up 15%. It, it could be stupid. It could be irrational, you know, but that's, all that's the same, isn't it? Right, mm -hmm. exactly. You know, and, and this, is, this is exactly what makes a market, and that's the beauty in it, because if you do believe in the mispricing, then you could express that in your way, but you also have to play the game, right? Because a, a stock that's garbage that's up you know 300 or 3000 percent people know like yeah it's going to come down but guess what if you short it while it's up a thousand percent and it goes up two more thousand percent then you just ran the risk of ruin and you just you're mm -hmm. you're, done. you're finished right so were you really that smart you know because yeah you were right but you didn't know how to play the game you didn't know how to express your thoughts and actually play in the game because if you were smart you would have you would have realized that wait a sec i guess i believe in this but i can't play that game because it's going to take me out so let me wait for something else or let me be quicker on my covers or, or you know like people people are very stubborn and and they tend to blame um the market for their losses you right exactly their ego their ego and they tend to blame the market for their losses and it's uh it's one of those things that those are the type of individuals that um you know you you just they, they don't end up being good traders. And, and a perfect example, you know, of like talking through this would be how we did during the whole correlation break, right? The correlation break took place, right? We were losing on all our positions because when the, that correlation breaks, it's very difficult for the book to, to, to structure its way back in, right? Because we are essentially are counting on the VIX correlation to kind of help our cost to carry. So when the market is going up, we're losing on all our convexity stuff. We're losing on um, the funding. So it would be some of the straddles. And then yeah. our short vol stuff is not helping cover the cost to carry, right? So the short vol stuff is not kicking in. So we're literally losing on all angles. But as experienced traders, my partner and I, 
okay, hold on now. We understand we're losing. We understand, you know, these correlations should come back into line. And, you know, they did. And, you know, obviously we were able to take advantage of it. However, during the midst of that, we have to do what's correct as traders and as, as managers and step in and say, hedge off that risk, find a way to hedge off that risk that is literally correlated, right? So if most of our stuff was like, let's just say, for example, was in the tech side, and our book was was getting crushed mainly on the tech side. Well, guess what? Don't hedge that off with something that's uncorrelated. Make sure that you know we go in and we buy Nasdaq futures or, or something like that, right? Because there comes a, a point in time, and you know this is this is one thing about markets too. You can't hedge off all the risk, no matter what you do. You know you can't. You just can't. And the way we structure the book, we make money when the market is stable, when the market is going up slow, and when the market is tanking. So so three yeah. out of three out of the four environments we're making money right but in the fourth environment where the market is just blazing up that's where uh, that's our negative impact on the portfolio right so that's where we have to step in as managers and say hold on now like something is wrong let's step in and make sure we hedge off that risk to the upside because you know we don't want to handle it whereas some people the more you know younger and the inexperienced guys will just be like no this has to come back this has to you know do this and it's very easy to say you know if, if you look at you look at a correlation chart to the SPX and Vol, it's very easy to say, yeah, correlations are going to come back into line. Yeah, sure. Because they, they do. They do. They do come back into line. But what if this is the number one? What if this is the first case where the correlation don't come back into line? Right? You mm -hmm. always have to be planning and hedging and, and centering your mind around the thought processes that this could be the one. This may not be the one. But this could be the one scenario where correlations don't and they just go for, you know, a month persistently like this. Now, in the realm of reality, we don't believe that. And we've expressed our view in that sense. And, you know, we, we as we've seen, correlations have been coming a little more back into line. But as a trader and as a, as a risk manager, you need to be focused and you need to say, well, what if, you know, is this worth, is this one trade or is this position or is the way how the book is positioned? is that worth enough to losing, you know, running the risk of ruin in your fund? It's absolutely not. You know, so we will never put that at, at, at risk. We'll never put that, that, that far at risk to say like, Oh, just let it be like, it'll come back. Don't worry. Like that's, that's not how, how good traders trade, right? You manage risk, you express your thoughts and, and you, you focus on the risk points as to what could potentially take you out the game. Because if you have a good strategy, right, you, you'll have environments where they don't work. But over the long run, you'll make money, right? You'll, you'll make money. So it's all about surviving in the game and surviving to play the game, you know, live to fight another day type of thing. You know when to tap. You know when to it's, tap it's, and try again, yeah. It, exactly. And, and you know best in jujitsu. Like we, uh, I know maybe there's some guys that's listening that, that do jujitsu, but we, we like to play the legs a lot, right? So heel hooks mm. are, the heel hooks are a big thing in nogi. And uh, if you are, Performing this heel hook, literally, you could tear a guy's uh, MCL and, you know, his meniscus. I've could, done that by accident. Right, not and that's, that's not good. And that could literally go in literally three to four seconds. Like three that. To four, three to four it's seconds. So yeah, You've exactly. probably seen it before. It's, and it's a great analogy that you just used there because the market can do that to you as well. If you're unprepared for a massive spike up or a spike down and... I think that's what people forget about volatility. Volatility is not just in the market going down. It can go up as well. Right, right. And, and uh, yeah, and that's exactly what we've seen. So you, you always want to position yourself in a way that you can live to fight another day. And if you have a good strategy and you believe in the strategy, you believe in what you do, there is no one trade that is worth taking to put the entire account or, you know, your livelihood or, even, you know, some fund managers out there. And, and I mean, you hear about it. Um, you hear about it on the institutional level so many times. You know, I, I know, Jamie, you, you're, uh, your picture on Twitter is the guy from, you know, option yeah, sellers. Option sellers. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, so like, like... Here's a guy who, he managed millions of dollars, you know, like millions of dollars. There are some, there are some great traders out there who will never have the opportunity to manage as much money as this gentleman did and you know no shade on him i mean you know like god bless his soul but you were shorting calls on one of the most speculative 
things that are out there. You're natural gas. Mm -hmm. You're, you're mm -hmm. shorting. You, you are opening you and your fund and your investors to literal asymmetric risk, right? And you literally could just go under overnight. And that's exactly what happened. You know, so I, I feel bad for the guy, you know, I feel bad he made that video or whatnot, but it's like, if you're a real fund manager and you're, you're, you're a real trader, you would never put yourself in that situation. Or, or if you want to express your view in that, in, in that sense, I mean, sell call spreads like don't tell me yeah. you're selling you know don't tell me you're just selling naked calls and one of the most risky is reduce your position sizing don't, right. don't you, yeah what do you think right, right. It, absolutely yes and you know like and for the younger traders who are listening to this there's always a way to structure a trade you could get into the riskiest trade that you want but you just cut your sizing down you know like if you want to sell um calls on natural gas I'm not going to sit there and recommend doing something like that, but let's just say you're super enticed in doing so limit your risk, limit your upside Buy the upside protection, do it on a call spread. Don't ever mm -hmm. put yourself in a position where you are exposed to the risk of ruin. And that's, that's the key in, in managing a book, a book with so many moving parts, a volatility mm -hmm. arbitrage book that has, you know, short vol stuff firing here and long vol stuff firing here. And for the record, anybody who's listening to this, you better believe all our short ball stuff is cap. There is a cap on everything. And you know, my partner will be the first to tell you, like we do not joke around when it comes to that. Like, because you literally never know, like, yes, like if volatility spikes through the roof, we're going to be making money on our, on our high convexity stuff. But on the same accord, you want to make sure that your short ball stuff reaches a level where you're capped, you're fine with accepting that loss. You're, you're comfortable with that VAR and you know, you move forward from there and you know, then, all your long fall stuff is taking you, you know, to a high level of profitability. Chris, just for yeah. the benefit of the viewers, um, I mean, I, I know Jamie's got something that he definitely wants to ask, but you know, just very briefly for the benefit of them, how, how do you cap that shortfall that you just mentioned? You know, just in case someone listens to this obviously and think, ooh, let's go try some shortfall trades, mm -hmm. how can they protect themselves, like you just mentioned? Yeah, so I mean that's the beauty in options, right? Because you could you could always uh you could always express that view and, and structure in a way that has some sort of a limited risk. I would never say, say for example, you're looking to capture, you know, the VRP by selling straddles on the SPX or something like that. Cap that straddle, like buy the wings, buy, turn that straddle into a condor, you know, or let's just say, you, you, let's just say for a fact, you're like, Oh, I want to, I want to um, I want to short the VIX ETPs when they're in Cotango. Like, like we like taking advantage of the low yield. So you know the Cotango process is something that we view as profitable. And you know we're Volarch, Volarb hedge fund, and we want to take advantage of that. Okay, we're not going to go in there and just sell UVXY short. You know, completely naked or something like that. We we express that in a different way, but. Let's just say you were like, yeah, I just want to just short the actual, the actual product. Okay. Let's just say you, j you go in and you short a hundred shares of UVXY. Well, I mean, you could pull up a, a chart, you know, it, um, split adjusted. It's actually very, very difficult to read those charts, but if you look at the performance at how these things have done, they could literally go to like 70 or a hundred overnight. It's mm -hmm. that, that wouldn't be a surprise. So if you're doing that, make sure that you buy a call spread buy a call spread at a level where you're comfortable with losing, right? So that doesn't mean that if you're short at 20, buy the call spread at 80, you know, that means find the level that you're comfortable with doing. Or, you know, if you're short at 20, that doesn't mean buy it at 21, find a level that you're comfortable with risking. What is your value at risk, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if, you, if you only want to lose $500 on it, on the trade, you know, then cap it at 25. You know, like mm -hmm. if, if that's your max loss, like cap it at 25, 20 to 25, five point risk. And I, I mean, there's, there's many, many, many ways to um, express this, that, that short fall trade, but you should always have a structure that will avoid the risk of ruin because if not, and you know, mm -hmm. I said at the beginning of the podcast is that it's a great trade to have the short fall trade. You know, I, I hate when guys, they, they, 
try to shit on it because it's it's a really good trade to have. It's bad when it's done systematically with no parameters around it, right? Yeah. When you're just saying, oh, yeah, I'm just going to go and short it, like, like there's no yeah, like naked, like a naked short position. That, that's right. crazy. Right, and especially a naked short position. It's bad enough that if you just say on every Tuesday, I'm just going to sell it. That's a that's a whole that's a whole other thing that I, I just don't believe in. Um, but if you're every Tuesday, you're going to sell it, and then you're selling it naked. That's a that's even that's like the double bad whammy. You don't want to do that. Um, but you know, you could the trade is there historically, and you could express it through different ways that you know you have some certain parameters and signals that you're like, yeah, well, when this does this, I like the short vol trade because historically it's performed well over this particular time series. And I want to just some vanilla example is, you know, short the stock, loan the call, you know, or um, sell a call spread, or, you know, even just buy put to buy put that's expressing a short volatility trade through buying a put where you're actually, um, you're actually long a put instead of, you know, selling the volatility. I, I don't want to go, too deep down there maybe i'm i'm confusing users <laughs> no, no that, that, that could be for another that that could be for another episode if we if we could have you on again because i mean wow it's just been such a such an amazing conversation sorry jamie go ahead man you know i know hey. <laughs> no it's been great just listening in it's been really good um yeah i suppose one thing which i suppose is kind of underpinning all these what well, the last conversation we just had about risk of ruin is measures of risk in a portfolio. So I can't remember what the fund was, but I think it's Malacote or something. I think they were short for the last X years, they were short uncapped variants. And of course you, you collect that additional premium for it being uncapped and it's a few basis points above uh, cap var. Um, and over the last 10 years where there hasn't been a massive sort of vol event, well, before Corona, obviously, um, their ratios are good. So stuff like a sharp ratio, standard deviation of return, whatever, that stuff all looks really nice. But then obviously where it's like short massively in the tails and it's exposed, it's almost like that short kurtosis trade. How, if you're, if you're an individual looking to invest in a fund, which is, let's say it's based in derivatives and maybe it's a little bit shady and you're trying to get some information out of the guys and you want to find out if they're just short um, terrorists. What are some of the warning signs that you can look for that are like, oh, this guy um, is just short tails and is collecting the premium and it looks really nice during calm periods, but then they lose it all and more during Corona crash. Because I think, I think we, were, we, were, we were like, uh, the vol was realizing on an annualized basis was like, over a hundred percent, it was something ridiculous like that. And of course, in the in the uncapped VAR trade, where, you're, where the variance swap, the PNL has that squared term in it. The further you go, the more in the shit you get. Kind of like almost exponentially. It's just crazy. Um, oh God, I've kind of gone off on a tangent here. Um, right. Okay. So how how would you look at a book and say right, this is short kurtosis or this is short skew? So. That's a that's a challenging thing to say. I, I know you said if you're looking to invest in a hedge fund, what are the uh, underlying sides to see? Okay, if they're you know, short tail, you know, the steady performance um, is definitely one thing to take a look at. How they performed also in in downturns is one thing to look at. It's really hard. It's hard to dissect that. You know, especially because hedge funds are very hush hush. Um, but it's it really comes down to um, putting an assumption on seeing some of the environments that they performed in and checking them back to see what the market did in that in that particular environment where you can kind of make sense of you know if a guy is saying like okay well this is what the strategy is supposed to do and you know another thing too for anybody who's out there who's thinking about investing in a hedge fund hedge funds just don't do this. Uh, it's funny enough. We was uh, we was finalizing one of the um, one of the uh, uh, investor pitches for for a firm. So we were actually fixing that up last night. I was fixing it up last night. Will and Sal are probably listening, laughing at this. But um, I actually was going through hedge fund performance. Right, I think it's the uh, the index HFREX or something like something like that on Bloomberg. 
basically it's the uh, hedge fund performance. And we were seeing this year, you know, they're down 3%. Um, and then we, I just, just, I just decided to check. I was like, let me see how overall hedge fund performance that's being tracked on Bloomberg has been doing since 2008. Um, and I mean, I was shocked. I seen them down 8% since 2008, right? So to now the, the return has been there down 80%. And I mean, Bloomberg has their way of computing which funds are associated in that, right? So I guess that that stat has to be taken with a grain of salt, but hedge funds just don't go like this. So when you see something going like this, straight up, you just have to, you have to do your due diligence and see, okay, well, how does the product work? What, where are the drawdown periods? Does this make sense? What is the structure? in the in the actual period right because if and, that, and that's the number one thing too right you don't have to you don't have to find out what the secret sauce is and, and then explain the structure to you um especially like like with us you know I, i'm very open to talking about what our structure is because sure you could give the structure to some college kid or to even to a fund manager he just wouldn't know what to do with it it's the, the strategy that's involved in actually that structure we just express our view through that structure you know so like that's a that's not that's not anything um you know groundbreaking but Mm -hmm. you know it if i tell you let's just say for example well yeah here's my structure i'm just selling uh spx strangles you're gonna be like well okay then you're short volatility right i'm gonna tell you that i am buying SPX shadows on loan volatility. So it's def- it definitely comes down to actually understanding the uh, the structure of to the what hedge fund is actually doing this and um, digging in a little more as to how they performed in certain environments. And just to you know just to reiterate, you know, I am not a person who is against shorting the tails. We have a certain part in our book where we run that, but we haven't put it to work all this year. And we don't think that we will be putting it to work all this year. But again, getting back to the, the toolbox reference, right? There's certain ways that you could do it. You know, we do not express this in a way where we're short you know, 90% of the book of the tales. No, it's a slither. It's barely a little slither of the book where we're like, okay, we could take advantage of the high theta, high Zoma effect of, you know, short tenor names after they have made a two standard deviation move and then we could look to, to price and certain things. So, so we have our way of actually expressing that. So I don't want to sit here and just be like, well, everybody who's short the tails are idiots because we have a way of expressing this. However, the way how we do it is capped. So we have a max cap. And then two, it's moving in relation to the entire book. So the book is moving and, and these positions are moving, right? As opposed to some guy just literally saying like, okay, every Tuesday I'm selling 10 Delta SPS uh, puts. And, you know, it's funny enough is because there's a, <laughs> there's a prop firm. I'm not going to air them out or whatnot, but there's a prop firm in the U.S. that they put out these, uh, these like, YouTube videos and stuff like that. And, and I'm the type of guy that I just always like watching. Them. Also, like, even if I know it's just garbage out the ass, I'll sit there and I'll just watch it. I'll just be like, all right, all right let, let's see let's see how this guy trades like let's see you know what he what he has to say right but but it, but again you know it goes back to what we we're saying is like the the level of of ignorance because who knows maybe maybe this guy would what he's saying it won't lead me to a trade but it'll have me think about something to know like okay guys are doing this why are guys doing this and maybe i could fade that trade you know or like so so you always want to learn and you always want to be uh, mm-hmm. constantly growing and, and proactive and reactive in, in all these things you don't want to just say like oh you know like I'm not even bothering to watch that. So I'm, I'm, the, I'm the guy that I go through a ton of, of uh, good content, whereas like, you know, smart guys talking and, you know, good research. And then I also go through garbage stuff too. And mm. I may, I may be not fully paying attention to the garbage stuff, but I'm still giving it a, 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 a mind. Um, so yeah, so he was basically saying like, you know, uh, one of his traders runs the strategy where, you know, you can make money every, every week. And I think, I think it was something literally like selling like uh, 20 Delta SPX puts every Wednesday for expiring on a Friday. And I'm just like, okay, okay. So like he, he goes and talks about how he checks the back tests and whatnot. Mm. And I'm just saying to myself, like, yeah, that's, that's not a good idea, bud, because yeah, you're going to, you're going you're gonna to pick up, you know, you'll pick up pennies for a good amount of time. 
Right, exactly. You know, like you'll you'll make a little money, but I guarantee you, you will give that back on like two trades. And you know, like again, that's not how we express trading the wings. That's not how we express Kurtos is selling. We express it in a different way where it moves in relation to the book. So if if that position's working against us, we may have something hedge where now you know the other position, uh, a name in that particular sector, has now picked up. You know so much Vega because that is correlated to that position, and now it's picked up so much Vega. We're profitable on our long Vega stuff, All right? So we lost mm. on the short, on the on the short, on the short detail stuff. But this other position picked up, and you know, and, and that goes with analyzing the, the the correlations and and understanding how the book as a whole is moving, right? Because that's the most important thing is is understanding how the book as a whole is moving. So mm. we do have we do have a component that helps generate yield. That is short details, but we're expressing it in a more sophisticated manner than you know, a lot of the individuals out there in the market is where they're just, yeah. uh, yeah, I'm just selling tails. I'm just, you know, that's, that's yeah. the, that's the, that's, that's the game. It's like, yeah, you'll do that for a couple months or maybe even get lucky when you run into a regime like 2016, 2017, where you just make money all the time. And then you think you're just too smart for the market. And then one day you wake up and you literally give it all back. Yeah, been there, done I, that. <laughs> you know what? I, I cannot believe how quickly this whole thing has gone. It's literally been almost two hours that we've been. Yeah, it, it hasn't felt like it. I mean, we we, we gel so well, and the conversation just keeps flowing. Don't you think, Jamie? It has been. It's been fantastic. But I think for the sake of sort of brevity and uh, making it a, a watchable video, yeah, on the on the on the end space, I think maybe we should give it a wrap up here and hopefully well, you're the leader today so, you know you yeah literally so, on this one. <laughs> so chris i think thank you so much for coming on today honestly it's been fantastic I learned so much it's been great to sort of pick your brain and i've loved i've tried to look at like the blue mode screen in the background that it reminds me <laughs> of, <laughs> yeah. reminds me of being at uni so uh <laughs> i can't wait to get back but yeah honestly thank you so much it's been a fantastic conversation yeah thank chris you, man the I mean, quite honestly, you know, you, you're, you're such a down-to-earth, easy-going guy to speak with, you know. We, we would love to have you on, on another episode whenever you have so, some time again, you know. It would be great to delve into some more topics and things because it's, as you said, it was nearly two hours and, and I feel we barely even scratched the surface of <laughs> yeah. what we can, we can get into. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's nice to meet a fellow, um, a fellow jiu-jitsu student as well, you know. It's, yeah, uh, for sure. It definitely is. I find that I always get along really great with, with traders in the market who are jujitsu guys. You know, we tend to be a bit more relaxed about things in a lot of ways. You know, there's no, there's no chairs beating and ego bashing go. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You're used to getting beat up. That's why you, know. yeah. you get it smashed out of you on the mat. So you're yeah. calm when you come into the trading room. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It's funny too, because, uh, a couple guys that um that I roll with, uh, they are actually and roll that means train for people who, who aren't familiar yeah, with yeah. jujitsu. Uh, a couple guys that I train with are actually fight in the UFC, so it's it's cool because you know I get a chance to compete against guys who are real professionals, and you know when they have their training camps, I get a chance to be a part of it and train with them, and it, it's a it's an amazing experience. But man, let me tell you, like those guys will really beat you up and you know, it, it, it definitely humbles you really fast. You know, you go from, from this sense of being like, Oh, you know, like I'm good. Some days it, it's, it's funny. Some days, uh, what's the expression? You're the, um, some days you're the hammer and some days you're the nail. You're the you nail. Know? Yeah. 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 So That's it's, amazing. uh, it's exactly, it's exactly like the market, you know, some days you, you think that, wow, I'm extremely smart. And some days you're like, damn it. I don't even know what's going on here, <laughs> you know, but, um, yeah, the two definitely well mesh together, but it was an absolute pleasure, guys. I'm I'm really glad that you guys had me on here, and um, yeah, we will absolutely do it again. Yeah, thanks a lot, Chris. I mean, Fantastic. much appreciated. So uh, have yourself. Uh, I don't know if you're rolling tonight. Or not. Oh, mind you, it's Labor Day on your end, so it might be closed. But yeah. uh, if you guys are rolling again, have fun. Uh, tap out when you need to, and tap a few guys as well while you're at it. You know, it's always it's always a nice sense of accomplishment. And we look forward to have you, having you on again soon. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Cheers. Then, uh, yeah. Thanks to you as well, Jamie. Great job, my friend. No, thank you, guys. Cheers. It's been great. Anyway, Cheers, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Likewise. Bye. Enjoy. Bye-bye.